Hi. This week, we're going to be talking about the Peacock Revolution and some of the ways in which masculinity was maybe redefined in the 1960s and 70s, or maybe kind of stayed the same. Uh, and you'll be the judge of that. Um, so the 1960s is this moment, particularly, and in, even into the 70s, but I think especially the 60s, that represented this kind of radical break from the past. And I think that's especially true for people who lived through that decade. Um, and so I want y'all to think about, um, as I'm talking through some of the changes um, and trends in fashion in that period, whether you think um, it is actually a radical break with the past and maybe reflect back on some of the time periods we've been talking about before this um, and think about if you see any resonance and similarity or, or if there are differences. So a few of the questions that we're going to be talking about and addressing this week are how performances of straight masculinity are changing in the 1960s and 70s, and um, thinking about why we think those changes are occurring at this particular historical moment. Um, we are also going to explore, especially in our discussion, some of the ways that homophobia and racist stereotypes play into perceptions and receptions of these new styles in men's clothing in the 1960s and 70s. We're also going to consider um, whether or not these changes are still with us. Um, if you think the changes and shifts in the way that masculinity is performed have been long lasting, or if you think they were rather short lived. Um, and also um, a question that I want to sort of keep in the air for discussion is how we see homophobia and racist stereotypes at play when fashion is marketed to men now in the contemporary periods. Do we see any kind of long lasting effects um, or lingering elements of those kinds of stereotypical representations that are present in marketing of fashion to men in the current moment? So the real question I think um, that we're seeking to ask in part um, today is how do we get from the man in the gray flannel suit to a man in a caftan, um, to men in skirts, um, which is probably like one of the more extreme style uh, shifts um, that we see historically, at least on the surface of it. Um, and also I think another question to sort of add into the mix is how prevalent were these styles? Certainly, as you can see in this great photograph from London from 1967, where you've got the policewoman uh, kind of poking fun at the um, the two two flower children um, in the front of the photograph, you can see there's a man in a suit in the background. Uh, so clearly, you know, it, this, this shift in this moment didn't mean that men stopped wearing suits. It didn't mean that all men uh, adopted caftans. Um, and so there's a big kind of diversity in style in this period. And that's one of the things I want to think about and look at. All that being said, though, here's my dad um, on the left in the um, blue uh, suit there with the big floppy tie. And then um, on the right, uh, my mom is just over his shoulder there in that photograph with some friends. Um, both of these are images from the mid 1970s. Um, and my dad, who is not really terribly concerned with fashion in his present life, um, the Peacock Revolution uh, certainly changed the way that he dressed. He adopted bright colors. He liked big floppy velvet neckties, these, uh, these bow ties that you can see him wearing in these images. He's got this great flower print shirt on under his tan blazer um, in the group photo. Um, and here's my parents' wedding. Um, he wore a, a white, uh, essentially like leisure suit tuxedo and white shoes. Um, and you can see that his groomsmen are in what I think was like a mint green. Um, and you can see here um, in the style of my dad's hair, which was worn long, um, as well as a couple of his groomsmen, that longer hairstyle for men, um, as well as facial hair, which you see on some of the groomsmen and you also see on my dad, um, was very much a part of the look of the, the night, late 1960s and 1970s. Um, and um, so, you know, it did change the way that... Um, many men looked, many men chose to dress, um, not just ones who were kind of dedicated followers of fashion. 
Also, I think important to note, um, can you see, I took a little trip in my parents' wedding album. Uh, this is a table of people at their wedding. It was in the afternoon. Um, and you can see this older generation at the wedding. You've got one man there in the back in a, a more traditional, um, either dark navy blue or a black suit. But uh, the rest of the men at this table um, have adopted some much more bold styles. Got a man in a white suit in the back there, a gray suit with white shoes up in the front, and then two men in these plaid suits. So much, much louder um, and bolder styles than you would have seen the generation before. Also notice those, those big flashy neckties they've got on. So there's a definite stylistic shift and a more kind of permissive style that comes out of this moment for men um, and takes us from this 1950s moment where there's a real um, kind of a single appropriate look in a sense uh, for men for most times of the day. And where that had been um, by and large, with the exception of maybe the 1920s, another moment when we see um, some important stylistic shifts, um, there had really been not a lot of divergence. And we talked about this at the beginning of our class. Menswear really is historically, has been historically about conformity, conforming to the rules. What, are you wearing the thing that's appropriate for the time and the place that you're at, whether it's, you know, sports or time of day, business, casual wear, all that kind of stuff. So in the 1950s, um, you have this very sort of regular style and there are certain moments of leisure when sportswear, when men can wear um, somewhat more um, bright, colorful, um, textured sorts of looks. Um, but those are very distinct times. Um, also, of course, neckties were places where a man could kind of express himself and embrace some color in his wardrobe. But it's it's a pretty limited palette of options for a man in the 1950s. So this way of dressing, this more um, essentially diverse way of dressing that we see emerge in the 1960s and 70s for men doesn't just come out of nowhere, of course. We've already talked about a number of different subcultural styles that help to kind of lay groundwork for what essentially is a youth culture that emerges in the 1960s. So I'm just going to remind you a few of them. We talked about the Zoot Suiters, of course, and their very bold, bright, colorful, large, like physically large uh, uh, modes of dressing. We mentioned the beats a little bit um, and their embrace of more casual kinds of looks amid the conformity of the 1950s. And even if you think about um, the images we looked at last week of Rebel Without a Cause, for instance, and um, this kind of teen culture that emerges um, in this period, you have um, a different way of dressing, a more casual way of dressing uh, for young men. And this different kind of image of masculinity um, that is emerging in this period. There's a number of subcultures in the UK, in particular in London and Britain, um, that emerge um, in this moment. One of them is the, the Teddy Boys, um, who um, are inspired by Edwardian dandies um, and are young men in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, usually listening to rock music. Um, and here you can see uh, some images of them as well as some Teddy girls um, on the bottom left there. And there's definitely a relationship between the Teddy style and uh, the zoot suit, the sort of loudness and brashness of the style, the boldness um, of it. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's another iteration and one that's specific, um, generally speaking, specific to, um, to Britain. I have to show you this next clip um, because it's just so fabulous and hilarious um, that will give you a sense of some of the hairstyles uh, popular um, among uh, uh, Ted's um, and other uh, young men in Britain in this period. To take the other extreme, hairdressing today is another art appreciated by men as well as by the fair sex. Practically gone are the days of the pudding basin and the modern hairdresser needs to be an artist to keep pace with contemporary styles. 
In fact, nothing surprises a hairstylist like Cyril. If the customer wants something really original, he's come to the right place. A chap who takes pride in, shall we say, his distinctive clothing, likes to cap it all with a hairstyle to match. So he orders the works. After a shampoo, the foundations of the new creation are laid with this barber's magic wand called a blower. It seems incredible, but hair can be molded as easily as plasticine, with results just as funny to some people. Sometimes, however, even a normally reliable head of hair fails to rise to the occasion. And in emergencies like this, when it just isn't long enough, a switch of false hair is thrust into the breach. Not everyone's cup of tea, but this is no time to split hair. To Cyril, the new style is a work of art. To the customer, it's a mark of distinction. To other folk, it looks like an elephant's trunk, which is just what it is called. We repeat, the elephant's trunk. The hair is carefully woven and curled round the uh, uh, trunk so that it doesn't work loose and a lack of fixative sees that it doesn't sag. The style may not be a practical one. It wouldn't pay to go near machinery, for example, but at least it's guaranteed to improve the memory. Have an elephant trunk and you'll never forget. So you can see in that clip that um, there is this kind of embrace of wild styles, at least among some young men in the 1950s. And the 50s, of course, kind of um, be just begins this moment in which you have teenagers who have a good amount of disposable income. Um, economies um, in the U.S. and in Europe are doing well. Um, and teenagers often have um, this discretionary income from, you know, jobs they work or maybe they get an allowance from their families that they start spending on clothes and hair. Um, and so there you can see an example of um, kind of greaser style, almost like gone to the extreme in the UK. I Sorry, I can't resist sharing that with you. It's too funny. You're home. Maybe you're bored. Try it out. Show me what you figured out. Get out some hairspray. See if you can make yourself an elephant's trunk. What could go wrong? So um, England plays a kind of, um, I think, a somewhat outsized role um, in this story, uh, London in particular, and, and that's really significant. So I want to spend a minute um, kind of exploring that. So we have this moment in the 1960s as the baby boom generation is growing up. They've got their own money to spend. Um, they have cultural capital and they're starting to have some political capital too because of that money. So they become a market that is explicitly being catered to um, by a bunch of different people. And that's what gives them, starts to give them that kind of cultural and potentially political capital too. So England in this moment is finally really recovered from World War II from the blitz, uh, from the physical damage um, that was, um, that happened there in World War II. Um, and it becomes a kind of center for fashion in a way that was at least somewhat for, at least for Paris, I think, kind of unexpected. Um, so we tend to think about the British invasion as like this music thing, right? You know, the Beatles, the Who, all these bands, the Rolling Stones coming to um, America and the popularity of that British British rock music, but there's also a really important fashion revolution. And I think interesting to know that Mary Quant, who you see on this slide, who's one of the um, most famous figures of this um, uh, swinging London moment from the 1960s, actually invaded uh, the US um, as it were before the Beatles. Um, so her clothes were in the US, I think in 1962 before the Beatles got there. So um, fashion got there first um, as as often is the case. Um, and here's Mary Quant talking about this, this cultural moment. She said, it took 10 years to start to recover from the war and suddenly the economy was booming and ours was the first generation 
generation which when young actually had money and therefore freedom to create a culture for itself and quant was very much um a part of this this cultural moment and it was made a lot of um in the press you can see here a cover of time magazine a u.s magazine um, which is creating this kind of mythical, uh, really like stereotypical image of swinging London. Um, it even included inside a, a map of all of the British, uh, the boutiques uh, that you should go to if you were going to visit London. And it really was um, London um, and the, the boutique culture um, of London became a real kind of tourist attraction. So in some ways, I mean, this is kind of the case with all of this. This really heady moment in the 1960s, there was a kind of mythology about it that was being created almost as it was happening. So that you have, you know, by 1966, you know, swinging London embodied. If any of y'all have seen like the Austin Powers movies, like, you know, this, these images are really powerfully still with us. Even if you've been to London um, as a visitor, you can see the way that some of these sort of swinging references continue to be used in ways um, of kind of framing the city for, for visitors. So this is a really kind of prevalent um, image of London. Um, and it was really used by the city um, and by the country as a whole as a way of kind of marketing the UK in the post-war period as its economy um, was recovering. So in addition to swinging London, there's uh, one other kind of key key term, maybe I mean, not one other, but at least one other key term in this period. Um, and that's the idea of a youth quake. Um, Diane of Reland uh, of Vogue magazine was the one who uh, gave this moment that name. Um, but you see it in a lot of different places here. You can see it um, in a cover from the, the London Times, which is reporting on, um, you know, fashion, uh, Mary Quant, uh, Tuffin and Full, and I'm showing you some of their garments on the left-hand side here. Um, another one of the boutiques um, in London. And you can also see both in uh, the Full and Tuffin garment on the left, um, and uh, the the poster on the right, the use of these um, patterns, these kind of op art influenced patterns and op art, of course, is also something that's happening in the 1960s. Um, and so, you know, you can see the ways that these um, eye catching patterns are being used to represent the energy of this youth quake. So what we see in this moment um, and in London in particular is this turning away from high fashion coming out of Paris um, and this more homegrown style that's happening really um, in boutiques and small boutiques that are popping up um, in neighborhoods like Chelsea and Soho, um, Carnaby Street. Um, and so you get um, Full and Tuffin on the left there in Soho. In the center, you can see Mary Quant's Boutique Bazaar, which she opened in 1956 with um, business partner, partners, Archie McNair and Alexander Plunkett Green, who would eventually become her husband. Um, and she opens that shop um, in uh, 1955. Um, so quite early on, uh, she's, um, you know, showing fashions there. And the way that Quant ran her boutique is kind of representative of the ways that um, a lot of people did. You see Granny Takes a Trip, another one of the boutiques in Chelsea on the right hand side there. Um, she didn't run on seasons. She didn't really pay attention to what was happening in Paris at all. Um, she would design new stuff when the old stuff sold out. Um, so there was no kind of uh, seasonality to things. Um, there was a much quicker turnaround, in fact, than what you'd have seen um, in department stores. Um, and of course, what you would have seen on the runways in Paris, where you would have, you know, you'd had two shows a year. Um, so she had studied um, at Goldsmiths College of Art, but she wasn't really formally trained. Um, she, tra she was trained artistically, but she wasn't formally trained in fashion. Um, and she started out selling other people's, uh, other designers' clothes and accessories, but then began sewing um, and designing herself. Um, and this is true and emblematic of many of the designers um, in London. Many of them were young, they were self-taught, um, and working out of these small self-owned boutiques. So she was really catering to women that she knew. Um, none of her clothes followed conventions of day wear and evening wear. It was just like where, 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 whatever. Um, 
they were very emphatically not what older women were wearing. So these were clothes for women who did not want to dress like their moms. Very, very different than previous generations um, had had done things. Um, and so you can see um, all of these styles, very short skirts. Um, Quant is often credited with the design of the mini skirt. Um, it's like any other really well-known design. You can't really say anyone did it. Um, we, what we do know is that Mary Quant first showed very short skirts in 1961. They didn't really take off until a few years later. Uh, the Paris designer, Andre Courage, uh, who's also sometimes given credit, didn't show them until 1964. So he clearly didn't invent them either. Um, and uh, by 1965, the mini skirt rose to six inches above the knee with no end in sight. And you can see that photograph of her, her on the bottom to get a sense of um, skirt length um, in actual proportion rather than like fashion illustration, crazy proportion. Um, but, you know, this is how she described the trend. She said, um, <clears throat> It was the girls on King's Road who invented the mini. I was making easy, youthful, simple clothes. We would make them the length the customer wanted. I wore them very short and the customers would say, shorter, shorter. So, you know, she talks about it as really being a reflection of what her customer wanted. Um, and she went on to say, the mini said, look at me. It was very exuberant, pure glee. Looking back, it was the beginning of the women's movement. Clothes always say at first, you know, then comes the effect. So I think it's a, quite an interesting reflection from Quant about how her clothing seemed to fit in and perhaps anticipate um, second wave feminism, which will really coalesce in um, the very late 60s and early 1970s. Um, the other thing you can see reflected um, in her clothes here is this youthfulness. There's a kind of childishness um, to the styles. They're sort of little girl styles in a way, um, like a... a sort of a uh, space age play on a pinafore, which is like a little apron that you would wear over a dress to keep it from getting dirty, A-line dresses, um, things like that. So these are very um, kind of youthful and almost childish looks, which I think is really intentional. Um, and there's a, there's this emphasis on looking young and even pre-adolescent, right? Because these um, the ideal silhouette for these kinds of clothes is kind of back to that 1920s um, flat chested, um, almost pre-adolescent look. Um, so there's some ways that this is kind of turning back to the 1920s in terms of silhouette, but a very different, um, kind of outlook otherwise, um, in terms of its form. And I think that sort of childlike quality is, is rather intentional. You may be asking yourself, I thought she was going to talk about men's clothes and she's still talking about women's clothes but i thought you i just want to give you like a few little moments of what's happening in women's clothes because i think that that can help us understand the context in which um these men's fashion changes are happening um because they're really about exploring the bounds of gender so with women's clothes in the 1960s um a lot of different things are happening but i think in particular the shortness of skirts um as well as this kind of um um, lean towards more kind of childlike youth oriented fashion, hence that name Youthquake. So as with um, women's wear, there were many uh, boutiques, there were boutiques that served both men and women, but there were also boutiques uh, that particularly catered um, to men. John Stephen was one of the um, the big entrepreneurs um, in uh, on Carnaby Street. He was often referred to as the king of Carnaby Street. He would eventually own 15 shops, including his clothes and One Male West. Um, and he really started out um, by adopting styles that had been popular um, among gay men in the late 1950s and marketing them to straight men. So we can very much see, and you know, if you reflect back on our conversation last week about queer style, you can very much see looks that were pioneered in um, queer communities, particularly among gay men, that then get um, adopted by straight men um, in this period. Um, and it's people like John Stephen who figure out how to market them. Um, and essentially the kind of stylistic shift that I think we see happening here, you know, if you reflect back on some of the styles that were popular um, among gay men that put a premium really on sex appeal, right? They were not necessarily about um, showing 
being how much money you had or what class you were. They were really about showing off your body, right? Um, and that's kind of the case with the styles that uh, a designer like John Stevens starts to market um, to men. They're body conscious, they're colorful, they're not about class identity. Um, they're they're really about showing a sense of a style and showing off um, showing off your your figure, um, which is what we would say if it was women. So let's say it for men too. Um, the mods, of course, who we talked about last week, this is very much part of it. And Stephen would have been selling um, clothing uh, for mods um, in his boutique. Um, he advocated, as well as many of the other designers, um, marketing and selling clothing um, on Carnaby Street, um, mini kilts, caftans, velvet blazers, low strung Tra low slung trousers that's hard to say and floral shirts um and you can see um it's you know the kinds of garments you could have gotten on carnaby street so interesting textiles older like more historical kind of shapes of garments here you can see on the left um from a street market in london a kind of low slung uh pant all different kinds of um, styles. There's a John Stevens suit on the right hand side, which kind of throws back to um, morning coats of the 19th century. So a lot of historical looking style. In the center, that fantastic uh, striped suit is by uh, Mr. Fish, um, Michael Fish, who is a really uh, fascinating figure um, in this story, um, who uh, opened a boutique um, and here you can see the interior of it, um, which was um, a collaboration, at least in business, uh, with this guy, John Barry Sainsbury. If, if you know uh, Britain, you know Sainsbury is the, uh, the grocery store. That's where this guy got his money. Um, and he was a young guy who was also kind of interested in this style and so worked with um, Michael Fish in, in opening this boutique. So um, you have a number of different uh, spaces in London from which to get these kinds of styles. And then the other kind of key factor in how these styles went from, you know, just this like one little corner of London to um, the world is bands is the music part of the British invasion. So um, the role of music and television becomes really important here. Um, so uh, bands like the Beatles, the Who would appear on television shows um, in Europe, but also in America um, and sporting these new styles from um, all kinds of boutiques um, in London and then spreading those styles. And so then those were the styles that kids um, who were seeing them on television wanted to wear too. So these bands became um, important kind of conduits for um, selling these kinds of styles. And so in a sense, what you see happening is a reduction in importance of what's happening on the runways in Paris and um, this increase in interest in um, what's going on in London, um, what's going on um, in the music scene, what are bands wearing um, and so forth. Um, so on the bottom there, you see the Beatles wearing um, one of the iconic garments of the period for men, which is the Nehru jacket. Um, the Nehru jacket gets its name from this gentleman, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the first prime minister of India. And it's a really interesting story, I think, because it's once again another um Another in a long line of stories we've talked about where you have a garment um, which has a very particular meaning in its original context, which is totally changed when it's adopted by others. In this case, Nehru wore this jacket, which is actually a Sherwani, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've never heard it pronounced out loud, so my apologies if I've gotten it wrong. Um, but this was a long jacket with a standing collar, as you see, not the, not the collar. Um, if if you look at that photograph with Eisenhower, right, where you can see the sort of V of his uh, suit neck revealing the necktie and the collared shirt worn below, this is not like that. This is just a simple um, round standing collar 
um, on this jacket. And this was an Indian garment. It was not a Western garment. It was a specifically Indian garment. And Nehru wore it as a particular statement. He wore specifically Indian clothing, clothing that came from India that was made with Indian cotton um, and styles that originated there as a political gesture, as a gesture um, against colonization, against the British Empire. Um, and he did this for almost his whole career as a politician. Um, and so it had a very specific anti-colonial nationalist meaning. It was about constructing national, um, a national identity for India through his mode of dressing. Um, and so it's very different when we see the Beatles uh, wearing it. It was adopted by um, young men um, in Britain um, and by others as this um, just kind of interesting take on a men's suit that was different um, from what they were used to seeing. Um, and there's lots of examples um, in this in this period of these um, kinds of uh, adoptions. Uh, so, um, for instance, I may have shown you all this image before, or these images before, but Yves Saint Laurent does a kind of African uh, collection um, in 1967, which is a very kind of stereotypical representation of Africa with very few um, actual representations of or references to African garments. I think it's Emma McClendon uh, from uh, FIT Museum who says something about this collection being kind of like Africa seen through the lens of um, Picasso. Um, and I think that's a really apt comparison. This is not uh, Saint Laurent doing like a really careful study of African garments and traditions and then translating that to the runway. It's it's a very sort of surface exploration. It's raffia, it's beads, it's um, big hairstyles, um, you know, wood textures, you know, natural materials, that kind of thing. So it's a very simplistic um, representation of quote unquote African style. And of course, you know, it's a, a entire continent summarized by this. So, you know, we all know to be dubious about this. But in any case, the Nehru jacket um, and that um, standing collar or then eventually just eliminating a collar altogether really takes off in the 1960s as this kind of um, alternative to traditional men's suits. So here you can see um, some suits by Pierre Cardin starting in 1960. Um, he began uh, to use that style um, to create these um, forward-looking uh, men's suits without kind of traditional um, lapels or collars, um, creating this kind of sleek, more comfortable look. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because um, for one thing, these suits you know, totally erase that origin of uh, Nehru and Indian style. So like once we get to Cardin's Cosmos suit here on the right hand side, you have something that maybe if you're a sci-fi fan reminds you of like Star Trek, right? Um, and that's the intended reference, right? Cardin is thinking about the space race, he's thinking about the future, and kind of trying to design avant-garde clothing to meet that future. Um, his uh, way of doing that is kind of interesting because in a sense, his designs always rely on traditions of suiting and tailoring. So for me, when I see Cardin's work and I was able to go and see the exhibition of his work at um, the Brooklyn Museum uh, in the winter, I realized how kind of conservative his revolution really was. Um, he is designing these modern clothes and certainly they're not traditional suits, but they're very much built on them. Um, and, you know, even the idea of the golfing suit there in the center from 1966, that he kind of imagines a future where men will still be playing golf in essentially in plus fours, which is what men would have been wearing to play golf in the 1920s. So there's something really interesting to me um, about um, his his style, the way that it looks to the future, but also is kind of conservative. Another interesting element, I think, of um Cardin's Cosmocorp style is that it became really popular with um, avant-garde folks like Rudy Geinrich, a fabulous designer who we'll be talking about next week, um, who also I think has a role to play 
um, in this story, although he designed mostly um, for women, but he was a gay man. And it was it was really, you know, trendsetters, uh, gay men for whom the Cosmo Corps uh, suit became uh, popular. Um, so there, you know, it didn't necessarily translate um, into mainstream style in this period. It was really more adventurous um, dressers um, who were wearing these clothes. Um, but Cardin's kind of style gets um, adopted by groups like the Beatles, um, and you you see them wearing um, this kind of style as you do on the bottom around 1965. And I want to just show you a brief clip of them uh, wearing these Nehru style jackets um, to play Shea Stadium in the U.S. In case you don't know what Beatlemania is or just how many eyeballs were watching the Beatles, I think this clip will give you a good sense of that. Um, and know that I have heard multiple stories from uh, multiple women I know, including my mom, including one of my uh, professors, um, about uh, their uh, kind of what we would see, I think, as like crazed reactions to the Beatles, including screaming at the television when they were on the Ed Sullivan show. So all the stories you have heard are true. Um, so uh, here are the Beatles um, at Shea Stadium. Just just a little taste. Okay, so since we're on the kind of influence of uh, the space race, which is one of the things that's happening in the 1960s um, on fashion and kind of this imagining of what fashion will look like in the future. And we're going to talk more about this next week, I promise. Um, but uh, worth noting that a lot of new materials uh, were being explored um, in fashion in this period. And so the 1960s is really full of contradictions in lots of ways. I mean, like any other time period, of course. And um, I think that we tend to have this image, and in part rightly so, um, of the hippies, um, you know, thinking about the environment and communing with nature. And um, at the same time, the 1960s were really the period that invented fast fashion, I think. And I suppose I'm thinking about this in particular because I'm recording this on Earth Day. Um, and the way that fashion sort of began to play out in the 1960s was starting to mirror the kind of fast pace that we experience fashion at right now. So somebody like Mary Quant in her boutique, she didn't really pay attention to the Paris seasons. And so she was making clothing um, as soon as she could sell it. And that eventually created a much picker, quicker pace for fashion. It was becoming faster um, with the sort of ad hoc production methods that these small boutiques were using. They could really produce fashion um, very quickly and respond to fads and trends. Um, and Mary Quant, like many designers of this period, um, made things for her own boutique, but also began to produce for J.C. Penney. So, in fact, she was uh, the British invasion before the Beatles. Uh, she arrived in New York. Um, uh, her clothing did at least um, at New York in New York and all over the U.S. at J.C. Penney's in 1962. Um, so, this you know quicker pace, as well as this emphasis on a youth market really helps to open the door for fast fashion because that youth market, while they're spending a substantial part of their money on fashion, they're also buying a lot of garments and garments that are disposable. Um, they're buying trends. They're spending um, their money on clothing that they'll wear a few times and then throw away. Does this sound familiar? Um, credit cards um, and their introduction this period also helped to give young people disposable income uh, available even sooner than they actually had it in their pockets to spend on these things. And this experimentation that you see in these images with plastics and PVC, I think, are part of that. And none of these materials were terribly long lasting or practical for fashions, but they sure were fun and looked like kind of space age clothes. Um, and people like Betsy Johnson were using them um, to create really uh, sexy outfits like this one that I think this is Lauren Hutton wearing, which is this transparent dress that the wearer can actually rearrange these kind of, um, they're sort of like giant sequins that are um, inside of it. So there's a DIY element here. Um, and then, you know, the, that uh, Stephen Willett zipper dress uh, where you can sort of rearrange the pieces of it. 
um, none of these things would have held up very well. And um, if you see any of them in collections and museums, they're a nightmare to care for because um, the materials tend to degrade. But um, this was part of the um, marketplace in the 1960s. So the same generation that gives us Earth Day also gives us, I would argue, fast fashion. The space race influenced many designers, including Andre Courrej, um, and you can see some of his um, very futuristic looking designs here from the 1960s. And Pierre Cardin in his women's wear um, was frequently uh, experimenting with synthetic fiber, including uh, his own uh, named synthetic fiber, fiber Cardine, which he um, thermoformed, so he formed with heat. Um, to create these dresses, um, they don't they don't hold up perfectly, but they don't look too shabby for being from the the late sixties. Okay, so we're going back to the Beatles just for a minute, I promise, because I want to talk about another one of the garments that you see um, in this photograph, and it's the one that Ringo is wearing there on the end. Um, so what Ringo is wearing, this this tunic or caftan, um, we could also call it a shiki. Um, and it's very similar to styles that we see um, worn by African-American men and women in this period as part of the Afrocentric style of fashion that was particularly popular um, among people who were activists or who identified with activist communities. Um, on the left, you can see a couple of ads from Ebony Magazine. Um, this particular print that you're seeing on the two on the left and that you could see on the um, the dashiki that Ringo were, was wearing um, are part of um, a style that's um, made with uh, what's called Dutch wax fabric. That's why you see it referred to as African Java print in the text of the ad from Ebony. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the Dutch wax story. I think I told it to you all already, but, um, if I didn't, you can ask me in discussion and I'll tell you again, cause it'll take me on another tangent. But I wanted to show you these images because we have yet another example of a garment that has one meaning, um, in, um, its use with the particular, within a particular community, in this case, African American community, where it's associated with the politics of the civil rights and the black power movement. Um, and then when it's taken out of that context, when Ringo wears it, it completely loses its meaning. Um, this uh, cartoon from the Chicago Defender, which was an African-American and, and still is African-American magazine in Chicago, um, excuse me, newspaper in Chicago, you can see the caption, the guy on the left is saying to the um, very stereotypical um, image of an African tribesman on the right, oh, I very definitely dig the African look, my man, but we've got to draw the line somewhere. So um, you can see um, some commentary on the adoption of these kinds of African styles by African Americans. But I have one more picture of this that I couldn't resist showing you, which is this one of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wearing um, a dashiki on the left um, as part of his embrace of this Afrocentric style. Um, and also just because it's such a great photograph um, to show you how just how tall he was um, in Life magazine being fitted by um, a tailor. So athletes were also um, participating in these um, style trends and certainly um, ethnic styles, um, what were then in the 1960s called ethnic styles, were very much a part of peacock masculinity. The Nehru jacket, the dashiki, um, and, and many others. And sometimes they were worn as the dashiki was in certain cases um, as a reflection of politics. Um, and sometimes that political meaning was completely drawn out and and discarded from them as is an example of when Ringo is wearing it. One more example, because I can't resist, of um, the ways in which this style of peacock masculinity was one which embraced sex appeal rather than class status. This is uh, an iconic um, look from the movie Goldfinger, uh, starring Sean Connery as James Bond from 1964. And here you can see the kind of lines, the slim lines of the continental suit transformed into a romper, 
So rompers for men are not new people. Um, that whole romp him thing that happened a few years ago, not new. James Bond did it in 1964. It's not clear that this was a style that was really popular with men in the 60s. Um, there were like matching cabana sets in the 50s and 60s of like, you know, uh, short sleeve shirts and matching swim trunks. But this is this is clearly sort of its own thing in this moment. Um, but I think if you look at the shortness and the slimness of the cut, you can see the way that this is a garment that is keyed to show off Sean Connery's figure. Um, that's what it's doing. Um, and so it's all about sex appeal and, you know, showing off an athletic male body. One of the other key elements of um, peacock masculinity and the kind of range of styles that was available to men and was being promoted for men at the, in the 1960s and 70s was historical styles. And I think Michael Fish is one of the best examples of a designer who embraced those kinds of styles. Um, he uh, opened a shop um, in 1966 called Mr. Fish, um, along with financial backing um, from Sainsbury. And um, at the shop, uh, he sold uh, garments like the ones he's wearing on the left hand side and the ones that Patrick Litchfield is wearing on the right. So um, very lavish luxe fabric. This was uh, generally a high end clientele or celebrity clientele that he was serving. Um, looking back to 17th and 18th century men styles moments historically when men were wearing ruffles and bows and elaborate embroideries and things like that. This for me is the very sort of dandy end of peacock masculinity. Um, mixing and blending different elements from different historical periods and just this kind of imaginative almost dress up box sort of style of dressing, which I think is very much part of this moment. Um, thrift shops were becoming um, a part of the way that people were dressing in this moment. So again, we have like fast fashion and thrift shopping kind of happening at the same time, which is really interesting, those contradictions. Um, but that was very much a part, the sort of pick and mix um, style. And a lot of these things worth noting, I think kind of come back in the 1980s. One of the most famous ensembles by Mr. Fish that you've maybe seen but didn't know was his is this um, beautiful dress that David Bowie wears on the cover of The Man Who Sold the World. And um, this was a part of a line of dresses for men that Mr. Fish um, produced in his shop. Um, and you can see the really beautiful, um, sort of delicate pattern as well as the um, really elaborate frogs, those closures on the front of the dress. Um, I think Bowie probably wears um, these styles uh, better than anyone else, but they were worn by by other men. Uh, Keith Richards of the, excuse me, sorry, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. Wow, that was confusing. Mick Jagger wears uh, a caftan, this white caftan by Mr. Fish um, on the left-hand side at a concert. Um, wears it with trousers, though. Um, and this is more, I think, the kind of like a almost like a medieval style. So you can see all the different kinds of historical periods. But if you look at these other photographs of the stones, you can see all different kinds of styles that were prevalent in the period. These kind of styles that are looking back historically, you can see these references to 19th century military styles and some of the jackets and the tailoring, these more like ostentatious military uniforms that were often colorful and heavily trimmed and decorated, fur coats, fedoras, uh, stripes, um, all kinds of different styles. If we look in America at something like Monterey Pop in 1967, we can see similar kinds of looks. You know, Jimi Hendrix um, often sported those kinds of 19th century uh, sort of military uniform styles and very much that kind of pick and mix um, aesthetic um, like uh, what we were seeing with Mr. Fish um, with the Mamas and the Papas there on the right hand side. You can see the caftan um, being worn as a unisex garment by both men and women. Um, so the introduction of certain kinds of unisex garments and caftans were popularly sold um, on Carnaby Street and a lot of those boutiques. Another example of a style coming from non-Western cultures and being adapted and used um, by uh, Europeans and Americans in this period. I think this quotation from John Lennon gives you a good sense of that kind of um, 
tension or contradiction that I was talking about in this moment. He says, the class system and the whole bullshit, bullshit bourgeois scene is exactly the same, except that there are a lot of middle class kids with long hair walking around in London in trendy clothes. Nothing happened except that we all dressed up. So reflecting in 1970, he was saying that, you know, none of these clothes really made a difference. This was just a trend. This was just a style. It didn't represent real change in people's lives. It didn't represent an actual upending of the class system. Um, and um, I would add, um, you know, my my two cents is it certainly didn't represent a total upending of um, gender politics or the politics around sexuality. Certainly the anxiety that we see, the homophobic anxiety that we see um, in this moment tells us that that's not over. Um, so there is, you know, even of the time, even people who were involved, this kind of questioning of like, what does this all actually mean? Um, and at the end of the day, the boutiques on Carnaby Street were stores. They were selling things. They were making a profit. Um, so there's that that contradiction kind of inherent here. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention um, with this uh, image, this iconic image of the Beatles on the bottom left from Sgt. Pepper, is I think that one way we might relate some of the peacock male aesthetic to, um, say, uh, Mary Quant and some of the designers for women is this um, kind of childlike quality. So Mary Quant is using like A-lines and pinafores and kind of childlike styles. What I think we see in the Sgt. Pepper images is um, this look of like dress up, like going to the dressing up box and like putting on um, these historical styles and mixing them. And I think we see kind of similar things from some of those images from like Mr. Fish and Jimi Hendrix that I was showing you before. There's a sense of sort of playfulness and playing dress up with these clothes, creating these different kinds of personas. And certainly for musicians, I think that was a big part of how they were using these fashions. And there is a kind of childish sense of play there that I think also is part of that um, real youth element of this culture. So I think that's something to kind of keep in mind and, and a way that we might relate um, what women are wearing in this moment to what men are wearing, just this sort of overall embrace of youth.